Uh, I'm going to be talking about the SDGs and local knowledge for development, um, challenges and opportunities. Um, I've been uh, quite a, a long-standing member of the EID Information Management Working Group. I came in the agent, KM for Dev and D Group, so I have really the feeling that I'm among friends here, which is really nice. And what I'm going to present to you is um, results from two papers. Um, one of them has been published in the European Development Research Journal, the EID Journal, and uh, just this year, and the other one's under submission. And it's based on research with colleagues at the VU University, although the first paper I wrote with Paul Hubink, so you, you may know him. And it's about uh, local knowledge and social capital for sustainable development. Well, there are a lot of systemic challenges facing no local knowledge for development. And one of the one of the facts is that you know it's divide defined in lots and lots of different ways, but quite often local knowledge always comes out worst in these definitions. So traditional is different to modern knowledge. Local is not global, so it's only locally relevant. And indigenous knowledge is also the knowledge of a very small group of people. And quite often it's uh, praised because of the links of sustainability, but actually environmental, but in fact local knowledge is often marginalised. And one example I'd like to talk about is the example of local, local, local academic knowledges, which I think ties in well with Ruth's um, presentation. And in particular, I'm going to talk about the field of development studies. And I presented um, the preliminary results of this at the EADI meeting a couple of years ago. So if it's a bit familiar, sorry. Um, OK, one of my favorite references on this is a group of researchers who looked at um, academic knowledge more generally. They did a search of the current contacts database and looked at research carried out in 48 least developed, com least developed countries. And they found that 70% of these articles didn't have any author included from that country themselves. But actually what was quite strange is that the life sciences and basic basic and applied sciences did really quite a lot better than the social and human sciences. And they had, quite, they had a number of explanations for this. Uh, lack of confidence, ignorance, negligence, or in fact one of their ideas was neo-colonial science. Okay, so my, my, in my research I looked at 10 journals including the European Journal for Development Research, the Yadi Journal, and I examined the web of science look at, looking for authors and where they were located. And I also looked on the journal websites for the editorial boards because um, I think often editorial boards in the literature, they're considered to be like the gatekeepers, so they really have they really play an important role in who's getting published or not. So I looked at um, 329 editorial board members, 200, more than 2,000 articles, and this is for the period 2012 to 2014. Okay, and what, what, what I found was actually fairly similar to the earlier research, that authors located in developing countries on average had 40% of all affiliations. So, I mean, this is, we're talking about the field of development studies where all of the articles about developing countries. That um, the UK and the USA were dominating with more than 40% of all affiliations, and that 45% were from other developed countries. That 9% um, of editorial boards 9% of members from editorial boards were from developing countries, so they were really very poorly represented. And quite interestingly, it was often a very small selection of countries. Many countries weren't included at all. For example, India and China were included quite often. Um, there's a do dominance of key institutions in the t editorial boards. And what was quite interesting, I couldn't do it for articles, but in terms of the editorial boards, I looked also at the representation of women because that's obviously a very, very important area for development. And on, on the whole, women made, were made in, making up 30% of the editorial boards, but one journal had, for example, 11% women. 
and one actually had 50%, so it was fairly varied. Okay, so this is the social network analysis that I did of the links between the institutions, the top institutions, and what are actually in the top journals. And you can see here the University of Sussex, which is largely IDS, which is, they have editorial board members in, in quite a lot of the journals. The red spots are the institutions, and the blue spots are the journals. And the most uh, heavily represented on editorial boards, but also as authors, were the, was the University of London system. So like the LSEs, the SOICs, the Kings, they really have, I think, links with, they have editor, editorial board members in eight of the journals. Now I'm just including this as a sort of reflection because this is when I use the definition of development, this is the definition I use. It's by a Karen for Deaf colleague, uh, Sebastian Ferreira. And, um, and I like this definition because he points out that actually development is something that takes place locally and that people in the north can help or not, but actually the process itself is something that needs to take place there. And uh, then you ask yourself about the representation of authors from developing countries and makes you think of it. Okay, so I think in this sort of case study of these journals, I think I sort of showed that um, local knowledge from academics is marginalised in journal publishing. So what, what I thought I'd do next was um, do the SDGs redress the balance in favour of local knowledge because you know they're the new paradigm for sustainable development for all countries and they're the first universal unified agenda and in fact knowledge and knowledge societies gets quite a, a good mention at the beginning that you know that um, the importance of developing knowledge societies and um, you know bridging, bridging the digital divide and accelerating human progress so what I did was um, I looked firstly about what are the what are the sort of reflections to date on the role of knowledge um, in the sustainable development goals, and I have some nice quotes from Ben Ramalingam, who's here, um, who criticises the model of technology transfer that uh, developing countries are vessels to be filled with knowledge and ideas. Um, the International Council who talked about the lack of reference to local knowledge and also Melissa Leach in an article saying that there's a failure that, to recognise that development needs to be based on developing countries' experience and realities. So what, what, what we did was we used critical discourse analysis um, to look at how knowledge is um, cited in the document of the SDGs, the document that was decided in August 2015, and we adapted the methodology to take into account sub-discourses, because obviously the discourse on knowledge and knowledge societies is a sub-discourse within this document. And we, we did this by looking at the history of past discourses and identified two discourses, the technical scientific economic discourse and the pluralist participatory discourse and be, so look before looking at the SDGs we look w which of the main discourses and these were there and I just show you this table it didn't come out very well as you can see and I fought with it for a bit then I gave up but if you can see <coughs> for example you have the, on the right hand side you have the pluralist participatory discourse which the main proponents so UNESCO and researchers like Robin Mansell, Steer and Castells and on the left, you have the technical, scientific, economic discourse, which is more the approach taken by national governments. And um, we looked at all of these different aspects. So, for example, the pluralist participatory discourse uh, recognises the value of local knowledge, whereas the other discourse doesn't. And also, for example, the, the uh, endogenous development in this side and exogenous development from outside in this one. And I think another one which is interesting is the transformational power of knowledge 
in the pluralist participatory discourse. So we use these sort of frameworks to look at <laughs> to look at how knowledge is um, to be found in the SDGs. And actually, what one of the really surprising things was that there was only 11 references to knowledge in the whole of the SDGs. So, like, I mean, knowledge was just not there. Um, And there, you know, there's only one reference to local knowledge in the in goal two, end hunger, and that's um, they're talking about traditional knowledge as a sort of subset of genetic resources. So like that was the only thing, the only local knowledge that is mentioned anywhere in this key document. Um, but the other thing we found is that the technical, scientific, economic discourse is dominant at the level of implementation of goals. So it's very much ICTs, technology transfer, science, but no mention of the knowledge of local people themselves, which is obviously, you know, the sort of the start of any local development. But there, what was quite interesting was that there was evidence of the pluralist participatory discourse at the level of vision and strategy. So what you have is a really weird vision and strategy, which is transformational and really like, you know, changing the, the world and people, equality, but actually when you get down to the implementation goals and targets, it's certainly in knowledge terms, it's really business as, really business as usual. So, uh, a quick overview of the challenges. So, the marginali marginalisation of developing country based authors in scientific publishing, so the marginalisation of local academic knowledge. A view of development which focuses on external, exogenous knowledge. And, uh, but there's also evidence that I think in development studies that this view is changing. For example, there's a really good article in Development Policy Review by a whole group of authors, I think about 40 authors, by somebody called Aldercott, in which they say that development, policy, development studies needs to change and become more transdisciplinary, so more involving participants and also as actors as well, as well in the research. Um, okay. So, marginalisation of local knowledge within the SDGs, an emphasis on the technical, scientific, economic discourse of knowledge in the SDGs, which is really business as usual, and also the pluralist participatory approach, which value, values local knowledge, is virtually absent. So based on this, you know, it's, let's not despair, there are some opportunities and possibilities. Um, there's a really nice publication on UNESCO which mentions that reflection upon knowledge societies and how to build them makes it possible to rethink development itself. So for, that, that, for us that represents an opportunity, I think. Another opportunity is the development of the knowledge development goals, which is going to be taking place in uh, Vienna in October, which I think is an opportunity to redress the balance in favour of knowledge for development. And at the moment, Knowledge Management Austria are collecting, um, collecting other narratives. And I put there the meeting in Austria on the board there for anybody who's interested in talking about it. I think it's going to be really, really interesting. Okay, um, another option are new models of development publishing. Um, one of the things which I concluded from the research I did looking at the development journals was actually, you know, for example, one of the reasons that medical journals are not, that, that authors from developing countries are not so absent is because they have very, very strict protocols about who is involved as an author. And uh, one of the things I propose also is that maybe IADI, that's a project that IADI might be interested in leading because they will be in a position to talk with academics and authors and editors to try and develop a different modus for development studies. Um, one of the, another possible different model would be the Knowledge Management for Development Journal, which is something that Ivan and I and other colleagues are involved in, and which is something we, it's not really a business actually, so that's not so good, but it's very, um, it's something, it's an open access journal that we all support because we think open access publishing is really important. Um, 
one of the really interesting things about critical discourse analysis is that actually you're, you're supposed to be using narratives, you're analysing a social role. And what it says is that the way you fight back this social role is you create new narratives, new powerful narratives. So one of these new powerful narratives, well, so we were sort of hoping that might be the Brighton Declaration tomorrow. So that's another thing that's on the board there. So, um, so in which we might be able to create a new narrative of possible solutions and challenges. So thank you very much. Thank you.